Um, very deeply serious as we search uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 1. Let's go there. <coughs> Um, let's look at, um, verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> um, actually, let's look at verse 4 first, and only the first part this time. Who get, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Okay, so there is this... <clears throat> um, there's this understanding that is in our minds that Jesus' primary purpose was to come here and to save us uh, from sin or save us from the devil or save us from hell or save us from this present evil world. And of course, it's, it's right here in Galatians, actually, chapter 6 and verse, I think it's verse 14. Where, where it talks about, I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. But this is, this is telling us that he separated you from your mother's womb to reveal his son in you. In other words, the deliverance from this present evil world isn't just saving you from your sins, but that by Christ being formed in you, that's going to save you from that. And of course, with that comes the cross. I, uh, same book, same, just next chapter over, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not on Christ liveth within me. Again, chapter 6, verse 14. This, this is the theme. This is the theme. He didn't develop it in verse 4, but this is the theme. Yes, there is. Jesus did die uh, for our sins that, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, but he spends the rest of the time in the book to show us how he did that and he does that by the cross and he does that by Christ being in us and that's the only true deliverance I mean it's the only true I can even say it's the only lasting deliverance you know um, so um, uh, so we usually see it in terms of, of grace that his grace is there to save us from this present evil world or what are all the things I listed that we make so important because we're, we think that this, that, that there was God and he was around a long time, then he made the world and then Jesus came within the realm of that and, it, and now what he's trying to do is just save us from all these things, hell and this present evil world and, and, and our, the punishment for sin and, um, but that would be to not understand before the fall why God created this, why the Father did it, and why the Son did it, and uh, this reality of wanting sons in the image of Christ for the Father, and this reality of a bride uh, who is after his kind for the Son, all of that not requiring the fall. It didn't require the fall for that to, to be in his heart. Right? Now, to get us to that point, since the fall did happen, he would have to die for our sins, verse 4. But verse 4 isn't the end of the book of Galatians. And that's why he begins to move more and more and more into the things that are important to the heart of God that, that are eternal because they were conceived before there was a world, before time. And, you know. <clears throat> and um, so to awaken to that, and we were talking about that 
uh, last class how Jesus, Jesus is fully aware of that. He was with the Father. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him. Okay. So there is this reality that before, you know, and, and the scriptures talk about Jesus being the lamb before the foundation of the world. Well, you know, if your only concept of Jesus' death on the cross has to do with delivering us from sin, then what the heck's he doing dying before the foundation of the world? Well, it didn't say he died. It says he was a lamb slain. That's who he is. Before the foundation of the world. That's right. That's right. Good. Um, so to, to begin to have the veil, and that's what I've always said, is that's what's behind the veil. Everything else, God is there. He's there in big manifestation. He does miracles. He does all of this outside of that. He sets up ministries and and the priests are all doing the ministries and stuff. But for all that time, nobody knew what was really behind that veil. The God that was behind that veil. What's up with that? You know. Um, we say, well, God wants us to seek him. Look, I don't care how much of a seeking heart that you have. You better not go sneaking in there to see what's in there. I'm just seeking the Lord. Ah! When was it rent? When Jesus said one day on the Mount of Olives, be rent, be open veil. No, it was rent. It was rent, not here in the Holy of Holies, but out here on a hill of rejection. That's, that's the result of that. Revelation, unveiling, comes when the lamb slain spirit <laughs> is manifested and we are supposed to look at that and go and and turn as it were and look to Calvary and see the true spirit that created all things we're supposed to find the eternal you know and the scriptures talk a lot about the eternal God but we always say that the God that existed forever before and ever after. That's what usually comes to our mind when we talk about the eternal God. Well, we are, yeah, it's the one that's been around a long time. I, you know, and the Father's going, wow, so proud of you. You're so deep. <laughs> and the way that you relate to me is so, you know, oh, God that, forever has been you still don't know him no. to the unknown God to the unknown God okay, well they know all about all kind of stuff and we do and I do and and uh, I you know I can tell you this personally I am in a I am in a place of deep hunger and deep desire after the Lord I am I am uh, turning and rolling uh, as someone who is n has not can't fall asleep for thinking about something uh, in their bed. Uh, what, I'm saying that I'm not doing that in my bed. I'm doing that in my being <clears throat> with desire to know him beyond what I know him. Now that shouldn't be hard because there's a lot. Right? <clears throat> but my desire isn't to know him for me. Usually, you know, I mean, I want to know him, right? Think about that. That's, I want to know him. But it's not that now. I want to know him so that he will, he will get someone who wa wants to relate to him the way that it is in his heart so that he gets the reward for me knowing him, not me. I don't know if that even makes sense. Yeah. But I'm telling you, 
But that's what's working in me, and it's working deeply, and it doesn't give up. And the Holy Spirit doesn't give up because he's going, we may have, a, we may have one on the line here. <laughs> you know? um, and it just is constant. It's just constant. And I'm so thankful for the time that I get to be with the Lord in the Word. And a lot of times he shares, and I'm a little bit like a scribe, but I'm not like a one that is yet fully grasped. Certainly not fully. That's ridiculous even to think. But even grasp kind of the little points he's trying to make. So I have to go back, and I have to be with him. I don't, I don't read it and study it. I go back, and I want to be with you. And what is, what is your heart? What are you trying to say? And... You know, um, anyway, so, it, you know, we're always joking that, you know, whatever I do always filters down to everybody because, you know, well, hopefully this will filter down because I genuinely, I am serious, as serious as can be. I love the Lord. And I love the Father, and I love the Father enough to give him not me but the Son, but that's going to take more of the work of the Spirit. Isn't it funny how all of this is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Um, so verse 7 in Galatians here, which is not an talking about the gospel, removed from him, unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And so they perverted, okay, we go, they perverted the gospel of Christ. You know, the word gospel means good news, right? That's what, that's the Greek, or from the Greek. It means good news. Well, for years, it was always the good news to me. That's what it was about. It was always good news to me. It's good news that I'm not going to go to hell. It's good news that I can be healed. It's good news that a demon can be dealt with or whatever. Or deliverance can happen. It's good news that, you know, all of this stuff. This is such good news. You know, I'm rejoicing in the gospel. The good news. But one day it occurred to me, this is good news to the Father. Amen. This is good news to the Son. That they could actually get what was in their heart. And it was just like, <laughs> yay. <laughs> you know, because, you know, don't you ever get sick of it always being about you? You know, and that doesn't show up as much as until you start hanging out with him a lot. And then it's like, okay, you know, because we don't even know what to talk about with him. You know, it's like, you know, uh, he's going, <laughs> he goes, oh, God, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yes, Mallory? I have a question about that. Because um, what we're talking about, these areas of knowing the Lord, like, you can't, like, search out a subject. Right. And then you've got it. Right. Like, you can't, like, shed light on the past of Scripture, and now this is, like, a whole different level of knowing the Lord that, that you, it requires the searching of the Scriptures, but, like, that can actually become an impediment. Like, problem if you're trying to relate by the knowledge, right. you see. So, um, in my study of the scriptures, the Lord will open an area mm -hmm. of himself. But I find that, and I, I'm kind of asking, like, what about this then? I find that it's fresh and it's new and it overwhelms and it soaks. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of just, I might write it down and then it recedes. And then if I come back to later, it's like, it hasn't fully taken. So I'm wondering about the process and all this, because it's not like I go to the scriptures and bam, the, the effect is immediate. So I'm wondering how much am I forgetting, or is it just part of the process that you kind of come to it and it has to kind of come at you a few different times or in a few different ways before this begins to take? Because it's something you can control or quantify. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I don't think there's... <clears throat> Personally, I don't think there's one answer to that, but I think that... Um, Part of it is, and this is, you know, I'm giving you some idiot's perception who is from Oak Cliff and doesn't know anything, uh, but as, you know, from, you know, from trying to sincerely give you something, 
I think there's a revelation of the scriptures and there's a revelation of Christ. And I think that the revelation of the scriptures a lot of times is a revelation of Christ in the scriptures, but not the revelation of Christ in us. And, and I believe that that's fine. I think that, I think if we understand that this isn't it, you know, that, but that's part of it. It's part of the process, but it's not it. See, and that's why I, because I've, I've experienced that for you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I have seen things from the Lord and the scriptures of about him and stuff that was, was just overwhelming stuff, you know, and, and um, so I would go, okay, uh, I, because I, I remember bunches of time at night, I'm laying there at bed and I'm not falling asleep and the Holy Spirit just shows me all this stuff and it's right out of the scriptures. It's just like, bam, and it's like, you know, heaven comes down and da 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 and you're just going, oh my God, oh my God. And you go, you know, I don't want to turn on the light and write it down because I don't want to wake Deb up, but I will never forget this as long as I live. Wake up the next morning and go, how did that go? Yes. You know, how, how did that go? And um, I think there's value in that. I think it's affecting our spirit even then. But I think that... Um, you know, Jesus said, search the scriptures for there they which testify me, but you won't come to me that you may have life. I think we come to the scriptures and we come to get Jesus, but we're not looking for life. That's John 5, 39. Um, his life. We're, we're wanting truth. We're wanting depth. We're wanting um, <clears throat> something shiny. <laughs> and But we're not wanting him in the sense of wanting that that transfer that transformation wow transfer for transformation that's excellent because i the word transformation requires a transfer from us to him yeah. and um uh so i think that's part of it i think that there's also um this is, the, again, all this is my explanation, and it may not be worth anything. But if I was way over there, and I started my journey, and I would do that, but the camera people would go nuts with trying to follow me. But if I was way over there, and, and young Christian, uh, you know, Bible-believing Randy just got saved, and now he's a Christian, and he's starting off. <coughs> um, you know, I was with Kenneth Copeland for, for a while. And then I went to Berean, and then I started hearing some things. And, um, and as I walked in the Lord, I would see things. Um, and to me, what I saw, because it was eternal and it was from the heart of God, it was as if I saw everything. But I was really only, it's like a million piece puzzle and I've just seen one little piece. But at the time, it's like, oh my God, this is beyond my mind. And, you know, all this stuff, and it seemed so big at that, especially at that time. And then you walk a little more, and then, you know, you see another piece, and you go, oh, look, this fits together. <laughs> you know, goo goo da da, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, and, and, you know, you're going, but why, why isn't this working in me yet or something? You know, because, and, and there's a process, there's a process to, to him that understand that he shall have more. So there, there's, the more you're gaining, the more it's all going to start fitting together and working together and having real, becoming more reality to you. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I mean, I'm fixing to be 68 years old, and, and I have genuinely, uh, you know, I, to my knowledge, I've never backslidden and I've never not had a desire for the Lord in the scriptures. And I know a lot of people do, but I haven't. And I'm thinking, because my mom and dad both died at 72, I'm thinking, okay, I got five years left. Uh, and the only thought that can come to my mind is, why did I waste so much of my time? That's what comes to my mind. Why did I waste so much time? You know, and Deb would go, you didn't waste any time. And I'm going, I, you know. I could have been in the shower, you know, reading the Bible or, yeah, I don't know, you know, because you, all you know is you want more. You know, it's like uh, Schindler's List. You know, if I could have, could have done more. Everybody's going, are you crazy? You saved so many lives. 
I could have done more. Well, you know, a bunch of you are young, so you don't feel any of this. But for me, it was like, it's still, it's like, oh, see? But that's what's churning in my heart. I, oh, God, I just want to know you. So at what point, I mean, you know, 68 years, 80 years, you know, what, 120 for Moses, at what point? There is no point. There is no real seeing and grasping of everything. There's only him. There's only him. And by knowing him, you know all things by Christ. But if you spend all of your time messing around with so much stuff that later on, it's, it's temp most of it's temporal anyway, and then you get down the road and it's so regretful, I can't tell you. It's so regretful, you know, um, because you just, uh, and, and again, because you're mostly young, there's no way to understand this, but you get to a point where you realize, I mean, you know, who was it again? I've said this recently, but uh, me and Shay were talking at the retreat, you know, and he asked me, That's I guess that's why it came to my mind. He says, what do you, you know, when do you think really you're, you're, uh, estimated time of uh, arrival with the Lord will be, and I told him what I just said to y'all, you know, my, both my parents and my family, they all right around 72. And he goes, okay. I said, why are you asking? He said, I don't know, just was, just was wondering. Um, but, oh gosh, there was, a, there was something else we said in that conversation. Anyway, so there is this, this thing that that hits you that um, uh, oh yeah so so I said back to him well you know if somebody said to me Randy what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back in five years I, go, I already know he's coming back in five years for me he's coming in five years so I'm I'm living what I this is weird I'm living what I would be doing if I knew Jesus was coming back in five years. Now, I know that sounds weird. You go, well, you're wasting your time. One of my, I'm sorry I'm jumping here, but I, one of my favorite stories was when, when uh, that was asked years and years ago, me and J.W., Augie Zimmerman, and Don Bird, and we were all sitting around the table, and some, someone among us said, um, you know, these are all Bereans, you know, and someone, someone among us said, uh, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back in 10 years? And one of them said, well, you know, I would quit my job. I would da-da-da-da, this and that and that, you know. The other one said, well, I would, I would um, just begin, I would try to get the gospel out there in the biggest way I could, you know. <laughs> and so J.W. sitting there and they said, well, what would you do if you knew uh, you'd be, uh, you know, Jesus is coming 10 years? And he says, I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. <laughs> I've always loved that. I've loved that. And it was so real to him. He was like thinking through it. He goes, you know, that'd be a good time. Incredible. Someone, I, this is crazy. I'm sorry. Someone asked me once, said, "Well, what would you, if you could ask Jesus in heaven, anything, anything, you know, because He's up there, the reality of all that. What would you ask Him?" I said, "Is Elvis up there?" <laughs> all right. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, let's go to Galatians 4 since I'm not doing too good with this right here stuff. <laughs> All right, Galatians 4, <clears throat> verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the, ful uh, the fullness of time, when the fullness of time was come, 
God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So there you see the, he came to redeem us, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. All right, so um, just the first verse there now say that the heir, as long as he is a child, and most of you know this, but there's two different Greek words. It's using the word child and the word, word son. The Greek word for child is tiknon, and the word for son is huios, and that's probably my representation of how to pronounce that. It's a dead language, you know. I killed them all. Not really. I don't, I don't know why I say this stuff. I have no clue why I say this stuff. It's ridiculous. Okay. It's not just a dead language. It's everybody who spoke it I killed. Okay. Um, so, so it is saying that you're a child, you're in the family, but that he's wanting more. Um, and most of you know, um, what is it, uh, Isaiah 9-6, right? All of y'all know Isaiah 9-6, right? Okay. Good. Um, not really. It's... Uh, <laughs> Unto us a child is given, unto us a son is uh, uh, born. born, sorry. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. And the, the, the little thing we can draw from that is in relationship to a child, you're born into the family. You are in the family. But a son is given, and this relates to that, that you know, by this perceive we the love of God because he gave himself for us and we ought to. Uh, but we won't until there's a, w most people say until there's a certain maturity. It's not. We'll see right here. The scriptures are absolutely clear that this has to do with the father and in relationship to the son in you. This is not a maturity thing. Okay. It, it could be, this could be defined as the maturity as long as this is what it's about. Anyways, before we get to that, that differeth nothing from a servant, though you're Lord of all. Okay, what does it mean? Well, if you're in the family, you're Lord of all. It all belongs to you, okay? You're in the family of God. It's all yours. You're not an outsider, all right? <clears throat> but it's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. All right, so there it is. This is a time appointed of the Father, this, this, and this goes along with your question, um, this, this has nothing to do with uh, us figuring something out and moving into that. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're, you're not going to figure this out. You are going to be what you are until he is what he is in you. Okay? All right. So, um, in the Father's heart, in the Father's heart, there is a place in time where you're no longer going to be under the elements of the world, ruled by the, the things around you. Okay, And I know most of us think, I'm not ruled by the things around us. Oh, my God. You know, I could ask the Lord, prove it to them that they are. Would you, is it okay if I pray that over you right now? So if you don't believe that... And then he'll set to work to prove it that we are under the elements. We're always under something. You know what I mean? We're under it, you know. Someone came to me once and said, man, you know, da 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 I said, well, you know, why don't you just go with the Lord? And they said, well, under the circumstances. And I said, quit. I said, get out from under the circumstances. Quit living there. Live from above. Live where we've been raised up and seated in him. <clears throat> And then all the things in the next couple of verses will come to pass, including verse 3, for you're dead. The best of the things that come to pass. You're dead. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, when we were tignons, when we were um, in the family, but what did children do? Okay. 
we, uh, and here's the deal. We say, and I, I taught on this fairly recently, and I'm not, so I'm not going to go on the whole thing, but, you know, Jesus says, except you become as a little child, and da-da-da-da, and da, 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 all this stuff. So we say, well, okay, I'm going to suck my thumb, and, oh, Father, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold his hand with my pinky, and I'm going to walk with the Father and say, this is what he wants. This is, well, that's a tape nun. That's, that's a child, you know. That's, you know. And it's, a, it's great. It's great. That's great for you, but it's not great for him. Because that's not his son. That's not Christ in you. That's not the nature of a son toward a father. That's a child for what he can get from a father. You know, and those are good things. I mean, I grew up in an orphanage and three foster homes. Um, and, you know, I think it would have been good if I had a father. But on the other hand, the father knew that I didn't need a bad representation or, you know, I needed him to see him. Or I would think if I had a really good father, oh, this is what a father's like, see. And I went, you know, my father and stepfather were monsters. <clears throat> Though I led my stepfather to the Lord before he died. Okay. So, um, even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. And we are in bondage. I don't, I don't care what you say. You, know, you can argue with me, and I won't argue back. But we are in bondage. We are, we are in bondage to this and that circumstance and this person. And like, you know, last class I was saying, you know, it's like this is standing in my way. I mean, I, you know, I can't. I can't get any further. I can't, I can't go further with Jesus until you take this away. And okay, so as a pastor, and I'm speaking now as a pastor. <laughs> okay, I just changed hats. Okay, I understand that we go through stuff, and I understand that we need the Lord and we need help and all that. So I'm not, I am not unsympathetic. All right? I'm not. Uh, and it's part of the job of a, of a shepherd is to help the sheep get to where, you know, where the father wants them. And I know where that is. As a shepherd, I know where that is. In Israel, they were agricultural nation. They kept not cows, but sheep. Because they sacrificed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sheep. So most shepherds knew they were raising their sheep for the altar. You know, you say, uh uh, they made pets out of them. <laughs> they, they called them Bobby and Susie and, you know, put little bows on them, stuff like that. No, no. The shepherd knew. He said, He leadeth me beside still waters and green pastures. Eat up, little fellas, eat up. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, Jesus said, and here's Jesus, see, I'm your leader. I will guide you. I will go before you. I am the good shepherd because I pamper you and I take care of you. No, he said, I'm the good shepherd because I lay down my life. Follow me. That's, the, that's, the, that's a good pastor. You know. I'm a good pastor because I've got a big church and, you know, I've got, you know, all this stuff and I've got a TV show and I'm a <laughs> televangelist and people know me and I'm, I'm a really good one, you know. And I, honestly, I used to be that way. That's what I would think. That's the way I thought. And, you know, boom, Holy Spirit, well, he changes, you know, when he talks, boom, oh, boom, we go, oh, my God, you know. I need to live this. I need to, I need to make sure I have this at work in me. And if I don't, then it's all for nothing. And, and it's not, there will be no fruit except the seed fall on the ground and die, except a shepherd fall on the ground and die. What are they going to follow? I'm just going to follow a man. And I, I can't live with that. I can't live with that. I can't have it. Okay, so 
Um, so there's this bondage. There's this bondage that we have. And we're, it's like wrestling and trying to, you know, and we go, I'm in a cocoon and I'm about to be a butterfly. And that's what this is. Not this. <laughs> you know, you need, you know, you need to quit wrestling because you're in there to die. Yeah. Now, in reality, it doesn't die, but, it, but in God's reality, that's the point of the cocoon. Yeah. You know, this is death burial. And then, you know, we go. So all this wrestling and this un whatever, it's just a cocoon. No, it's you probably griping in your being about the cocoon. Yeah. This isn't comfortable. I thought it'd be more comfortable than this. <laughs> Where's my pillow in here? <laughs> what what happened to my favorite pillow in the cocoon? You know, all that kind of stuff. We're just, we're just, you know, but, but see, that's just a, a, a little picture or whatever. The real picture is you and me walk in the halls of this place or being in contact with family members that you don't get along with or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's like, again, I can't get past this. My God, if you were dead, you could get past it. But you're not dead. No, I am dead. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it in the, in the Word. I've seen it in, in the book that you wrote, Randy. I know I'm dead because I read it right there. You know? then why, why this constant, unending, up and down, up and, yeah. well, I'll tell you why I'm up. God moved it, now I can get, I can get past this, you know? Woo! I can jump over a wall and you know, run through a troop now. But, but it was, when God had to remove it, and when he did, but then it shows back up again. I thought that was, what well does? I thought that was dealt with. Uh, it's not that that's trying to be dealt with. You know, the Lord wants to introduce you to a certain reality. There. That deals with you and me. That deals with the problem. Well, what was the problem? You! You! All the, and, and we say, I'm in bondage, get me free. You're, you're in bondage because you're a child. <laughs> That's what it says. I'm not a child. I've been with the Lord for 50 years. You know, so I'm not a child. I'm not, I'm not. You know, and I'm having to witness this. You know, I just want to get a mirror and go. I'm not, I'm not. Who's that? <laughs> That's you. So then it's taken by the hand. You know, Jesus died so that he could live in us. Really? Could you hold my hand a little tighter? <laughs> Do you think that would make a difference? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just need a pastoral hug right now. So I just want to hug him the small hug, you know. <laughs> I just only have enough strength to give you a small hug. <clears throat> anyway. But I don't. I don't do it. I don't. I don't do it. I keep going and pointing to Christ and him crucified because it's the only hope. You say, at what, you know, at what point do you get tired and just stop? Uh, first step. But you don't stop. But you get tired in the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth because you believe you know, like 
like Ephesians, till we all come. See, I remember when I was in Bible school and the Lord spoke that to me. And I said, well, you know, you know, we got people that are not there and this and that and da 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 da. And he said, just keep, keep going till we all come. And I went, that's a long time. Well, now I realize it. Still, it's a long time. You watch. He'll make me live to like 92, still doing this. <laughs> He'll just, you know, and I'll still be going, well, Christ and him crucified. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Randy, you're a hunter. <laughs> Yeah, Randy, you're 120. <laughs> well, it's a book of God. Anyway. anyway. But when the fullness of the time was come, that means there's an appointed time of the Father, and that's the fullness, but it's, we go, what time is that? Is that like on a Wednesday? You know? Or, what, you know, we've got all the, you know, there's going to be a special time. It's the special time is when you're ready to die and let Christ come forth in you and glorify the Father. And see, that's the, well, let's just read on here. Um, God sent his son. He sent his son, not, not your Savior. Shame on you. He sent his son, and you're going, he sent the Savior for me. Tell me, Lord, what is it that was so special in me that you would save me? <laughs> you know, he just looks and goes, well, I hate to break this to you. <laughs> Nothing. You know. you know, I'm dying for the ungodly. That would be you. <laughs> that hurts. It hurts when you talk that way to me. <laughs> It's like, that's the truth. Get with me or, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Anyway, so God sent forth of his son to redeem them that were under the law that with the purpose of that we might receive the adoption of sons. Okay, and I don't want to go, I think there's enough classes. I mean, there may not be all that many, but I've taught the adoption of sons many times over, Okay. So I'm not going to go into the fact that the adoption of sons is not taking an orphan, an outside kid, and making him a part of your family, and he's not of your DNA, and he's not of your spirit, and he doesn't have the spirit of the family, but you pat him on the head and you say, you're one of us now. And then, you know, when he becomes a teenager, he kills you in your sleep. <laughs> you're laughing. On the news tonight, really? yes, very same story, okay? No, he takes his own child that, and he puts him under tutors and governors and there's, it works something. But what is tutors and governors? What's people, you're under them. You're, it's telling you what to do. It's bumping you. It's, it's pushing you. It's, you know, and the example I've always used is, you know, um, you know, God, God wants to put his son in you. For example, he would want to put, let's say, really a good coffee in, in your vessel, you know. But every time somebody bumps your vessel and hits that vessel, bitter tea comes out, you know. Just bitter, bitter, bitter. Why did you hit me? You know, why are you making my life uncomfortable? Instead of being able to hit that thing and that sweetness of Christ come out. And when I say sweetness, I'm not talking about sugary da-da-da-da. I'm just talking about Christ, not us. That's the best thing that could ever happen. Um, so, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, and this is an interesting wording, and I am not going to get to go to the next part. Or the next part, which is going to be so fun if you can remember tonight. So I'm going to ask you to, to try to remember, because you are sons. How much do I have here? Because you are sons. Because you are sons.
God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I'm going to explain that because it seems to be self-explanatory. Well, we're sons, and he does that. But, you know, that can't be the truth. It can't be the fullness of the truth because the fullness of being a son is the son in you, crying, Abba, Father, and the spirit of the son being towards the father. So we'll explain that. The best example we're going to get is still in Galatians. It'd be over in, uh, well, that's actually at the end of this one because it's going to explain that. But also the prodigal son. Excellent, excellent explanation. Okay, God has sent forth. God hath sent forth. Okay, so it's God sending forth, okay, the spirit of his son, his son. So who is this God? It's the Father, his son. God hath sent forth. But at this stage, until it's come in you, there is no Abba Father. It's just God to us. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Before this comes forth, he's just God to us. But once the Son comes forth, it's like a transformation happens. And we'll see this. Oh, it's just great in these next bunches of places I'm going to go to. Once this is done... There, it's not a knowledge, it's a spirit of his n nature begins to come forth. And it cries, Abba, Father. It doesn't say, oh, God, thank you, thank you. That, it's, it's not on that level. It's not God doing something for you anymore. It's the Father sent forth the spirit of his son. And I'm crying, Abba, Father. Oh, yeah, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Get ready. Into your hearts, not into your soul, into your spirit, not into your mind, not into your body in that sense. It's your heart is invaded by the original. Capital O. By the original. Your heart has been captivated oh praise God Abba father wherefore meaning based on this thou art no more servant but a son and if a son then an heir of God through Christ so okay so because you're sons but when this happens wherefore you're no longer a servant son this is going to be so good, I'm telling you. May I remember to come back up here and bring this down and show you how this fits together. It's really good. Father, we thank you for this time that you give us. We don't want it to be class. We don't want it to be just learning stuff. We don't want it to be fulfilling an obligation to a Bible school or a church. We want it to be about you. Father, we want it to be the son that makes it about you and not us trying to make it about you. So we ask you to keep, keep your eye on the appointed time, what, what you would call the fullness. This is it. This is the fullness. This is it. The son, the nature of the son coming forth. Hallelujah, Father. Fullness to you. That's what you call fullness. So continue, Lord, I ask to link these things to what we'll be sharing in the next time. And may it honor you, and to you may be glory and honor forever and ever, world without end.